Coming up on this V12 production special, we're looking at train accidents from 2022. First, we'll examine three grade crossing accidents. Two of them caused major derailments. Then a bizarre incident ends with a runaway locomotive and a head-on collision. After that, we're asking the question, how safe are North American locomotives? And finally, we'll look at the machines used to pick up the pieces and clean up after train wrecks. Those stories and more are all coming up next on this V12 production special. Hello and welcome to this V12 production special. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're discussing a topic that can be both interesting and frightening, train wrecks. Railroads are an essential industry. They run through big cities, small towns, and countless neighborhoods across America. Trains carry goods and passengers from coast to coast. There's no doubt, every day, rail workers are dealing with heavy metal, hazardous materials, and trains that seem to be getting longer and longer. Modern freight trains are an impressive sight to see, but with all that tonnage, when things go wrong, they can go wrong in a big way. So in this special, we're going to examine several derailments and accidents. We'll try to understand why they happened and how we can stay safe around the tracks. First, dramatic video showing something that happens far too often in the US, a grade crossing accident. Friday the 13th in Duluth, Georgia, and this car is turning onto the train tracks. The driver tries to back out, but can't. Then things go from bad to worse. The crossing gates are activated, and a train is on the way. There's no audio in this surveillance video that was posted on the Duluth Police Department's Facebook page, but you can probably imagine what the collision sounded like. Looks like the car took out one of the crossing gates as it was hit. Luckily, police say no injuries were reported. Furthermore, they say the driver told them she was unfamiliar with the area and accidentally turned onto the tracks and got stuck. This all happened on May 13th, 2022, around 9.45 p.m. here at the crossing on West Lawrenceville Street near downtown Duluth. This is the camera that was pointed at the tracks the night of the collision. After spending a little time at this location, I would say this is a fairly busy crossing. There's pretty steady road traffic. And according to the USDOT crossing inventory form for this crossing, there are an estimated nine total day through trains eight total night through trains, and six total switching trains. The form says the train count data is from 2021. The tracks here are operated by Norfolk Southern. They go from Atlanta, Georgia to Greenville, South Carolina, and the train involved in the collision was headed south. The USDOT crossing inventory form says the typical speed range over the crossing is between 50 and 60 miles per hour. As we should all know by now, freight trains take a long time to stop, especially at those speeds. Amtrak trains also pass through Duluth, and they often run at higher speeds than the freight trains. According to the USDOT crossing inventory form, the maximum timetable speed here is 79 miles per hour. Searching the crossings number on the Federal Railroad Administration's website, only two highway rail grade crossing accident incident reports come up, one from 2019 and the other from 2004. Both involved cars, but fortunately, no injuries were reported after either accident. So what do you do if you see something like this happening or if it happens to you? And keep in mind, I've mentioned some of these things in previous videos, but I think it's worth repeating. First of all, if there's immediate danger, get to a safe location and dial 911. Now, if you don't see or hear a train coming, find one of these blue and white signs. These are called Emergency Notification System, or ENS signs. They have an 800 number you can call, along with the crossings number that you can give to the operator to tell them exactly where you are. It's pretty clear, grade crossing accidents are a problem here in the U.S. According to FRA statistics posted on Operation Lifesaver's website, there were 2,131 highway rail grade crossing collisions that occurred in 2021. Also in 2021, Georgia ranked third in number of collisions behind Texas, which was first, and California, which came in second. You should always expect a train when you're near the tracks and don't stop on crossings. 
Remember, trains are wider than the tracks, so just because you're not stopped directly on the rail doesn't mean you're out of danger. Make sure you can completely clear the crossing as you approach it. You know, warning signs and devices are here for a reason, to keep everyone safe. Everything stayed on the rails in that last video, but unfortunately, some grade crossing accidents end with the train on the ground. This was the scene after a CSX train hit a tractor trailer in Douglas, Georgia on February 7th, 2022. The drone video you're seeing is courtesy of the Douglas, Georgia Fire Department. According to the accident data as reported by railroads on the FRA's website, the train was going 54 miles per hour. The accident data also said two railroad employees were injured. You can see CSX locomotive number 777 is on its side next to a parking lot and intermodal cars are off the rails. These photos, courtesy of the city of Douglas, show us what the scene looked like on the ground. Meanwhile, as the drone flies forward, we can see the crossing where the impact happened. And it looks like the truck was hauling small fishing boats. Next up, another great crossing accident involving a tractor trailer. And this one was hauling a much bigger load. Trains are rolling through Collegedale, Tennessee today, just like they have for decades. But on Tuesday, December 20th, 2022, the scene was much different. A Norfolk Southern train was off the rails after hitting a truck. But this wasn't just any tractor trailer. This one was hauling a 134 foot concrete truss beam. Here's part of the specialized trailer, not too long after it was hit. The Chattanooga Fire Department shared these pictures on its Facebook page. At the time they posted the images, they said personnel at the scene were working on stopping a diesel and lube oil leak but no other hazardous materials were involved. According to the Hamilton County Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, two railroad employees had minor injuries and were transported to area hospitals. That agency also reported on its Facebook page that according to fire officials, the truck driver was stopped on the railroad tracks waiting for a traffic light to turn green. I do not know about his condition after the accident. Let's just hope everyone is okay now. This was the scene six days after the derailment. Trains are moving at reduced speed. And by the way, Collegedale, Tennessee is about 20 miles east of Chattanooga. The main line here has been open for several days now, but debris and wrecked locomotives and pieces of rolling stock are all around. As you might imagine, this has become a minor tourist attraction. You can see what's left of that concrete beam next to the lead locomotive. No doubt, this engine took a beating. That concrete beam was headed here, a bridge project that will eventually cross the railroad tracks and allow drivers to bypass the crossing where the truck was hit altogether. Meanwhile, railroad cleanup crews have a lot of work ahead of them. I saw damaged boxcars, covered hoppers, and bulkhead flat cars. Also, here's a locomotive truck with a traction motor on top of it. Of course, everything has been pushed back from the right of way. Also, it looks like new crossing gates have been installed along with new trackside signals. Now, I'm no expert, but it seemed like the trailing locomotives didn't suffer as much damage as the lead engine, but there might be issues we can't see. With all these grade crossing accidents in the U.S., some companies use their own locomotives to raise awareness about rail safety. Atlanta-based Norfolk Southern has several units painted with the Operation Lifesaver logo. If you didn't already know, Operation Lifesaver is a nonprofit that teaches the public how to be safe around train tracks. The organization was founded in 1972, and this CSX ST70AC celebrates Operation Lifesaver's 50th anniversary. 4568 was painted at CSX's shops in Huntington, West Virginia. It made its debut in 2022. This engine is painted like nothing else on CSX's roster. It's got plenty of Operation Lifesaver decals and also has a special message that we should all pay attention to on its roof. Now, we're going to see the aftermath of what was, in my opinion, the most bizarre train accident I have ever covered. This is the aftermath of a head-on collision. And these two locomotives are in bad shape. They're sitting on a Norfolk Southern siding in Rome, Georgia. BNSF 6746 has the most damage. You can see twisted metal on the front of the engine and bent handrails on the side. Meanwhile, NS9867, its headlight still on, is not looking great either. Both engines are covered in coal. 
To explain why, we have to go around four miles south to Lindale, Georgia. Here, hopper cars are on the ground and coal is everywhere. So what exactly happened to cause so much damage? Well, here's what the Floyd County Police Department posted on its Facebook page early in the morning on Saturday, September 10th, 2022. Railroad crossings in Lindale will be closed for an extended period while Norfolk Southern investigates an incident that caused two trains to collide at around 4.15 a.m. Okay, here's my understanding of what happened, and I'm getting this information from sources who I consider to be trustworthy. Coal hoppers were derailed in this area. This northbound intermodal train hit them. Its lead unit, that's the BNSF engine that we saw at the beginning of this video, then somehow broke free and continued north, ultimately striking a stopped train head-on in Rome, Georgia. As for injuries, I'm not 100% sure. Let's keep in mind that there were human beings out here and not just machines. Let's just hope everyone is okay. Now, I started recording this footage around 12.30 p.m. on Saturday. By the time I got here, crews had already made a lot of progress cleaning this up. You can see one hopper on its side and what looks like the remains of another one. Excavators are hard at work scooping coal into dump trucks. I saw some of that coal being dumped about two miles north of here. Back in Lindale, these guys are sucking the coal off the right-of-way with vacuum trucks. You can also see piles of fresh ballast ready to go. Not far away, this BNSF power is also covered in coal. BNSF 6789 was one of the engines pulling the intermodal train. Now the coal hoppers at this scene are marked with RWSX. They were going south to Georgia Power's Robert W. Shearer plant in Juliet, Georgia. These massive coal trains originate out west in Wyoming's Powder River Basin. They're so long and heavy, unmanned, radio-controlled locomotives known as distributed power units are needed in the middle of the train. Like I said earlier, I think this is the most bizarre accident I have ever covered. Let's just be thankful it wasn't fatal. You know, looking at some of these accidents, it's amazing the crew members inside the cab survived. So just how safe are North American locomotives? Georgia clay all over an orange locomotive. From what I've been able to gather, this is the aftermath of a collision with a loaded dump truck. And it looks like it was quite an impact, but I'm not enough of an expert to tell you if this locomotive is a write-off or not. Most of the twisted metal is up front. And that Georgia clay is not just here on the nose, it's on the top and the sides of the engine, too. Let's hope no one got hurt. I captured this thing sitting on a siding in McDonough, Georgia on October 22, 2022. The line here is operated by Norfolk Southern and goes from Atlanta to Macon, Georgia. There's definitely some damage here, but the locomotive cab itself, where the crew sits, seems to be okay, at least on the outside. Unfortunately, here in the U.S., railroad crossing accidents happen far too often. This one happened in Villa Rica, Georgia back in 2020. Luckily, according to the Highway Rail Grade Crossing Accident Incident Report, no one got hurt, including the people in the locomotive's cab. These days, modern road locomotives, the ones you see hauling massive long-distance freight trains, are equipped with the North American cab, also known as the safety cab. The wide nose here provides added crew protection compared to what's known as the standard cab, which was present on most new locomotives into the mid-1980s. The visibility on these is good, but the front-end protection could be better. This SD45-2 features a standard cab. The locomotive was built by General Motors' Electromotive Division in 1974 for the Seaboard Coastline Railroad. It's on display at the Southeastern Railway Museum in Duluth, Georgia. The wide noses on modern locomotives are built with thick steel, thicker than sheet metal. 
and vertical collision posts inside the wide nose provide further protection. Now, locomotives with wide noses were not all that common in the U.S. until the late 1980s and early 1990s. But north of the border, Canadian National started the trend that would eventually catch on. Its so-called comfort cab provided added safety benefits and protected the train crew from harsh Canadian winters. These stunning photographs, taken by Roger Puda, are of SD40-2s featuring General Motors' early version of a wide-nose cab. A lot has changed with Canadian National over the years, but its road diesels still feature wide noses. This locomotive was built by General Electric. Of course, some American freight engines also had this feature long before it caught on. The most famous locomotives to have wide noses were the giant twin-engine 6600 horsepower Union Pacific DDA 40X Centennials. These giants were built by Electromotive from 1969 to 1971. Meanwhile, in the 21st century, here are some of the cabs you'll see on big six-axle diesels. At least on the outside, GE's design hasn't changed much in 30 years. But EMD locomotives have evolved slightly. Here's an SD70M built in 2000. And this is an SD70 ACE built in 2007, paired with an older SD70 Mac built in 2000. Finally, one of the most modern locomotives on the rails today, an SD70 AH T4 built in 2019. By the way, there are some other EMD wide nose cabs that I just don't have images of and wasn't able to include. Pack and McDonough, there's something on the front of this engine that sticks out, literally. This is called an anti climber. As its name suggests, it's designed to stop one rail vehicle from overriding another. As you might imagine, there have been tests done to determine the effectiveness of the wide nose cab. Several videos of tests like these are available on the FRA's YouTube channel. These studies are from the early 2000s. The results are available on the National Archives website. There's no audio in these videos, but I think you can imagine what these impacts sounded like. The cab in this test held up well after hitting a truck hauling logs at 50 miles per hour. The metal of the nose was bent, but the researchers found that if humans were inside the locomotive cab, they would have been okay. The FRA also did tests with rail cars, and the wide nose cab performed pretty well. One takeaway from this footage is that most freight cars don't have anti-climbers, although I don't know that it would make much of a difference. Maybe an expert can weigh in on this. Now there was one test where the wide nose cab was badly damaged. Here's the locomotive hitting a trailer hauling two steel coils at 58 miles per hour. The steel coil at the back of the trailer here weighed 35,000 pounds. The impact was intense and caused severe damage. The right collision post inside the nose of the locomotive sheared. Also, after the impact, the researchers had trouble analyzing the data from the crash test dummy inside the locomotive cab. This was more of an extreme test which showed the cab's limits. There's no doubt. Lighting is also an important safety feature. The lights on this unit have either been crushed or are covered in all that Georgia clay. You've probably noticed that headlights have to be on when a locomotive is in use, even during the day. And since 1997, leading locomotives that travel at a speed of 20 miles per hour or faster over one or more public grade crossings have to have functioning ditch lights. Those are the lower two lights that you see here on this CSX locomotive. And some locomotives are set up to have their ditch lights flash when the horn is blown. Now, I do not know why the headlight wasn't burning on this engine. Oh, and by the way, the Canadians were also using ditch lights before their American counterparts. Okay, now to something you might not expect, and it involves bullets and cinder blocks. So far, we've talked a lot about the nose of the locomotive, but what about the windows? According to FRA regulations, they should be able to withstand a ballistic impact with a standard 22 caliber long rifle lead bullet of 40 grains, and also the impact of a cinder block. And by the way, that goes for the front and side windows. 
Now, I've saved two of the most obvious safety features for last, horns and bells. Most rail fans love horns, but some members of the general public do not. No doubt we've all heard that standard crossing sequence. Two longs, a short, and a long blast held until the locomotive occupies the crossing. These days, pretty much every modern locomotive has a multiple chime horn. Designs vary, but here's one example. As for bells, some are pneumatically operated, like this one. Here's what you'll find inside. No surprises here. Looks like a bell to me. But this does not look like a bell. It's electronic and basically just plays really loud bell sounds. One other somewhat obscure safety feature is the emergency fuel cutoff buttons on either side of modern locomotives. Now, there's one more thing I should say before wrapping up this video. Standard cab locomotives are still in use and pretty common. You can often see them switching in yards and industries and on short distance locals. There are some other safety devices that I didn't go into detail about in that video. For example, alerters. They make sure engineers stay attentive while operating. Some other features worth mentioning include event recorders, forward-facing cameras in the cab, and, of course, positive train control. All right, the next two derailments we're going to look at both happened in June of 2022. Not only did they happen in the same month on the same railroad, coincidentally, they also happened in the same part of a busy Atlanta rail yard. A sunny day at Norfolk Southern's Inman Yard in Atlanta, Georgia. The weather's nice, but there's a problem. At least one locomotive is on the ground. Kansas City Southern number 4841 landed here as it was leading NS train number 371. This happened Saturday, June 4th, 2022, around 1045 AM. Stuart Lodge, a fellow rail fan, captured this dramatic image as the engine derailed. The train was navigating the crossover here at the southeastern portion of the yard. If you're wondering what a crossover is, well, here's how the book The Railroad, What It Is, What It Does defines it. Two turnouts in which the track between the frogs is arranged to form a continuous passage between two nearby and generally parallel tracks. Now it's hard to say if the Norfolk Southern locomotive behind the lead engine stayed on the rails. I was around 450 yards away from all this and was really relying on my zoom lens to figure out what happened. As for the third unit, it was uncoupled and run back to the engine terminal. The freight cars behind the engines had been pulled away before I arrived. I started recording at 11.43 a.m. By that time, the railroad was busy assessing the situation. Keep in mind, this is an active rail yard and trains are constantly coming and going. Crews will have to clear this up quickly and safely. Fortunately for the railroad, the main line was not blocked, but the tracks here are still a vital part of the yard. Like I said, the weather is nice today, but it is hot. I would say temperatures were into the mid 80s by now. Around two hours after the incident, trucks from RJ Corman began to arrive. First, a pickup. Then, the big guns, side boom tractors. RJ Corman is well known for cleaning up derailments. I can't say this with 100% certainty, but I would imagine they have guys on call 24-7 to respond to scenes like this. For the railroads they work for, time is money. Now the access road next to the rails where this happened was probably a little too narrow to unload the heavy equipment on those flatbeds. They were getting that equipment ready somewhere out of sight. Around 45 minutes after arriving, there were those side boom tractors rolling toward the scene. Then. It was time for these big machines to go to work. First, they'd need to get that Norfolk Southern locomotive out of the way. Again, I can't tell if it left the rails or not. Meanwhile, switching continued not far from the derailment. Next, the main event, getting KCS 4841 back on track. It's pretty amazing how quickly the crews are able to move these big tractors across the rails. Here, you can see guys throwing wood blocks under the caterpillar treads to help the tractor maneuver. The 
booms on these machines say safety is our priority. There's no doubt, what these guys do is dangerous work. An engine like this GE ES44AC weighs more than 200 tons, and it's not every day you see the nose of a locomotive up in the air. Luckily, RJ Corman's machines are designed for this. Lifting locomotives and rolling stock is a pretty specialized task, but you can tell these guys know exactly what they're doing, and they're really efficient. It looked like they were done lifting the front of the unit for now. It was around 2.20 p.m. at this point, and time to lift the back end of the engine. RJ Corman would need to reposition its equipment. Then, another big lift. And like I said earlier, this is an active rail yard. NSP-51 would be rolling by beside the derailment site as it wrapped up its work at Inman. The engineer would need to make a little noise to make sure everyone knew they were coming. As that was happening, RJ Corman moved to the front of the engine to get ready to lift it again. Then, with the nose up in the air, they slowly set it down. And after hooking onto the rear one more time, it looks like 4841 was back on the rails. They'd then use their tractors to pull it back beside the Norfolk Southern locomotive. Now, another team would need to move in and fix the track. In all, the re-railing here took a little less than an hour. Pretty amazing, considering all the tonnage involved. Now, I did cover a derailment that seemed to be similar to this one back in 2020. It also happened at Inman Yard, at a location southeast of here. According to accident data as reported by railroads available on the FRA's website, these locomotives traversed a defective rail which broke, causing the derailment. Unfortunately, derailments happen from time to time. Luckily, the one today wasn't major. It's a hot day in June, and a locomotive is off the rails and on the ground at Norfolk Southern's Inman Yard in Atlanta, Georgia. This is the second derailment I've recorded in this area of the yard this month. Another engine went off the rails at the crossover here on Saturday, June 4th, 2022. In an odd coincidence, the locomotive that we'll be focusing on in this video, NS6217, can be seen working behind the derailed Kansas City Southern engine. The incident we're looking at today happened on Wednesday, June 22, 2022. Let me tell you what I observed about this derailment. First of all, the unit that's derailed, NS6217, is often coupled up to something called a slug. Slugs don't have diesel engines and rely on the mother unit that they're connected to to provide power for their traction motors. Norfolk Southern designates 6217 as an EMD ST33 ECO, or ECO. An interesting feature about this mother slug set is that it can be operated remotely. Now, I arrived at Inman at 6.05 p.m. and R.J. Corman was already hard at work with its side boom tractors and an excavator. R.J. Corman is well known in the rail industry for cleaning up derailments. I should mention, while I was here, it was 95 degrees, but fortunately, there was a breeze. While the crew worked on getting the locomotive back on track, NS train number 222, led by three BNSF engines, was working the yard. Triple two, over. Yes, sir. There's no doubt, Inman is a busy place. One thing worth noting about NS 6217 in its current state, besides the fact that it's derailed, is that it's got some damage here, near the cab. Its fuel tank also appears to be punctured, and it looks like the slug suffered some damage too. But at this point, the guys with R.J. Corman were focused on lifting the rear of the locomotive. Meanwhile, it looks like NS-222 was finished with its work at the yard. 
Now, the equipment used by RJ Corman is pretty interesting. The company's side boom tractors, sometimes called sidewinders, have huge counterweights that are extended to keep them from tipping over when lifting heavy loads. These things are also used in pipe laying applications. From my vantage point, about 450 yards away, it looked like the real challenge of this job was getting 6217 out of the ditch it created when it derailed. But the men working down here were making steady progress. Look at the technique this excavator operator uses to get his machine over the rail. At this point, the tractors moved to the front of 6217 and started lifting. This was a bit of a drawn out process, but it has to be. There's a lot of weight up in the air. In this footage, you can see them lifting, then setting the locomotive down, and then repositioning their tractors. As that was happening, something interesting came across the radio. Copy that, guys. Got a Sperry that's going uh, to take a detour down there at Jones for you. Going to cross over, and I get you rolling here in just a few minutes, though. Trucks like these are used to inspect the rails. Back at the derailment site, the lifting and repositioning continued. Now it was time to move the machines to the rear of the locomotive and raise it up again. As this was happening, it looked like 6217 was leaking diesel fuel. Off-road or off-highway diesel fuel is dyed red. It is not subject to state and federal excise taxes, unlike the fuel tractor trailers and other road vehicles use. At this point, the crew's plan was clear. Get the locomotive's back wheels onto the middle of the crossover here. After setting the back wheels down, the men with RJ Corman moved to the front of the engine. This entire time, it looked like workers were trying to address all that leaking fuel. It was close to 8 p.m. now, and it appeared this would be the final lift before 6217 was back on the rails. Meanwhile, there was activity on the main line that passes through Inman. And just like that, 6217 was rolling again too. It was being pulled out of the way by one of the tractors. Ultimately, I was out here for about two hours watching this cleanup. I don't know exactly when the crew got started, but it's still amazing how much progress they made in the amount of time I was at the yard. So now with the sun slowly going down, it was time for the side booms to move out and track crews to move in. In those last two stories, you've got a taste of what it takes to re-rail big locomotives. So now it's time to take a look at the machines, both past and present, that help cleanup crews get the job done. Let's face it, 99% of the time, locomotives are the stars of the show out here on the tracks. But railroads and the companies that work for them also use other interesting and unusual machines to get the job done. Track gangs help repair, replace, and maintain the rails, while specialized trucks and trains inspect them and look for potential problems. But there are also unique machines that move in when things go wrong, and the railroad has to call in the cavalry. The 
piece of equipment I've seen the most while out covering train derailments is the side boom tractor. These versatile and highly mobile machines re-rail locomotives and rolling stock or lift whatever else needs to be moved. Sometimes you'll even see them helping with a repair. So let's take a closer look. The tractors here belong to Holcher Services and are staged in Atlanta. They travel on flatbed trucks, but the entire piece of equipment can't fit on one trailer. The boom and counterweights travel on a separate flatbed. Now, the counterweights are movable and keep the tractor from tipping over when lifting a load. These machines also have huge winches in the back, in addition to other gear the crews might need to clean up a scene or re-rail a locomotive or other train car. There are also lights all around the tractor so it can run at all hours of the day and night. So what are the origins of these side boom tractors? Looking at this historic footage, here's one helping to construct a pipeline. Yep, for decades, these things have been used for pipe laying. Of course, when accidents happen, some companies will also use more conventional equipment that's been outfitted to work on the railroad. These dump trucks have high rail equipment and can run on the road and rails. Some machines like this also have rotary dump bodies to get the ballast right where it's needed. You'll also see less interesting but still useful excavators and backhoes cleaning up accident sites. Some of those machines have high rail equipment as well. Also, contractors are often hired to get ballast and prefabricated track right where it's needed and maintenance of way equipment is eventually brought in to repair the right of way and get the trains moving again. Okay, so that's a very brief look at how they do it these days, but I would say the machines of the past are even more impressive. When an accident occurred back then, it was time to call in the big hook. Railroads owned huge steam and later diesel cranes and used them to get things back to normal after an incident. This 250-ton crane belonged to Conrail and was built in the mid-1950s by Industrial Brownhoist for the Erie Railroad. It was stationed in Conway, Pennsylvania. This machine was retired in 1994 and is now at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. Looking at this model, we can see these big railroad cranes had main and auxiliary hooks, and they were self-propelled, allowing them to move around the accident site. But even though they could move under their own power, a locomotive was used to get them to the scene. Railroads strategically placed wreck trains, like this one, around their systems. Trains like this would often pull cars that could haul away debris and cars that could haul the new materials needed to get the tracks back open. Crew quarters were provided in old passenger coaches or other converted pieces of rolling stock. Idler cars, also known as crane tenders, traveled with the rail cranes. They provided spacing for the crane's boom arm between other cars. They'd also carry cabling and other accessories the crane might need. So whatever happened to the so-called big hooks that showed up when things went wrong? Well, many railroads have done away with wreck trains and their crews, preferring instead to use contractors to clean up derailments. This saves the railroads money. Now, this is really just a broad overview of the equipment railroads and contractors use today and have used throughout history to get the right-of-way cleaned up. I've probably left some things out here, but hopefully this has given you a good look at the men and machines who are essential to keeping our railroads open and operating. Once the right-of-way has been safely reopened, it's time to remove any salvageable pieces of equipment. No surprise, damaged locomotives and pieces of rolling stock often end up riding the rails once again on their way to be repaired, but this time on top of specialized flat cars. Here are a few of those high and wide lows that I've seen this year. First up, locomotives that were involved in a derailment in Hiram, Georgia in November of 2021. When I recorded this footage, they had only loaded the lead engine, number 8133. This locomotive ended up on its side after derailing. And you can see more of those side boom tractors ready to load the other engines. They'd eventually put one locomotive on each of these eight axle flat cars. The one hauling 8133 has a load limit of more than 469,000 pounds. You can see cribbing has been built to go under the locomotive where its trucks would be. And more is waiting here. According to the accident data as reported by railroads on the FRA's website, the cause of this derailment was listed as T311, switch damaged or out of adjustment, and also E64L, worn flange, locomotive. I believe the locomotives here in Hiram ended up going north to Norfolk Southern's facility in Altoona, Pennsylvania to be repaired. 
Now, I am not sure what happened to the pieces of rolling stock that I'm about to show you. Here's a covered hopper sitting on a flat car at Norfolk Southern's yard in Irondale, Alabama. Look closely and you'll see most of the damage appears to be on this end. Next, a box car on a flat car that I recorded pulling into Norfolk Southern's Inman Yard in Atlanta, Georgia back in July of 2022. I couldn't see too much damage on this one. There's a little bit of bent metal on the box car near where its trucks are. And finally, here are some tank cars on flat cars that I photographed at CSX's Halsey Yard in Atlanta in August of 2022. Again, I'm not quite sure what happened to these. You know, not every derailment creates a big scene. Many are minor and require no heavy machinery to get things back on track. Al Y in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a place where two major U.S. railroads meet. These are the diamonds in Atlanta where Norfolk Southern crosses CSX. But today, there's a small problem. A CSX locomotive is derailed nearby. It's a hot afternoon on August 21st, 2022. From the air, you can see employees from CSX and at least one man from Norfolk Southern assessing the situation. No doubt, both railroads want to see this resolved so they can resume normal operations. Norfolk Southern has to cross CSX rails here to get its trains onto its right-of-way that goes from Atlanta to Greenville, South Carolina. Now, the train in question today is Y120-21. It was likely working nearby Hal Yard. You can see in this file footage that Hal Yard is relatively small. You'll often see that CSX trains have to pull down here when switching. Before I got to this location and started recording, there was another train on the track right in front of Y120. It was actually blocking those critical diamonds that I mentioned earlier. One thing you'll notice is that there's no heavy machinery here ready to rerail this engine. Many of the derailments I've covered in the past involve a contractor using these side boom tractors. Instead of those, you can actually see a member of CSX's mechanical department getting ready to put a re-railer under the locomotive. Someone called it a re-tracker on the radio. If there's a difference between that and a re-railer, maybe one of you guys who's done this before can let me know in the comments. Anyway, before he gets under the engine, he needs to make sure it's not going to move. Three steps is A applied for the man setting the re-tracker on the CSX 5216. I understand. Got a three-step. We're working at rec site protection, going for re-railing right now. According to the Railroad Dictionary on the CSX website, three-step protection requires, quote, the locomotive engineer to apply the train brakes, place the reverser in neutral position, and open generator field switch. Even with the safety precautions in place, it still takes a brave man to get under the wheels of a massive locomotive. And the locomotive we're talking about is CSXT 5216, a GE ES44 DC. You can see one of the engine's sunshades above the engineer's side windows is hanging off the cab. There also appears to be another sunshade between the rails here. I've made it pretty clear so far. This is a busy and critical area. Here comes a Norfolk Southern train. It would not need to cross over those diamonds. It was headed south. But this very short CSX train running long hood forward would have to wait. MTO the L709, over. 709, MTO. You guys holding up right there, over? Oh yeah, we ain't going nowhere. I just want to make sure there. Thank you, sir. The CSX dispatcher also made it clear to the train's engineer not to approach the diamond. Not that they were going to. I'm going to talk some NS trains across this crossing there at Howell Tower, so do not get near the NS crossing at Howell Tower until we speak again. As you heard, the railroad calls this point Hal Tower, and there was actually a man tower here at one time. Of course, CSX now controls this spot from Jacksonville, Florida. A short time after getting those instructions from the dispatcher, the train's engineer got some more guidance from the men working to re-rail the engine. Command 120, engineer, over. Fly 120, engineer, answering, over. Mechanical says cut out number three traction motor while we do this, please. Unfortunately, at this point, I had to go and wasn't able to stay and watch them get this thing back on the tracks. But don't stop watching just yet. I'm going to give you a closer look at one of these re-railers in action. This is a good example of one. I watched a crew use it in Somerville, Georgia back in 2017 to get Southern 630 back on the tracks after its leading wheels hit the ground. This was a pretty drawn out process, but they eventually got it.
Back in Atlanta, you can barely hear over the radio that the CSX locomotive was also successfully re-railed. Am I on the rail on this 120? On the rail, baby. I was not able to find a cause for the derailment I just showed you. It may not have met the monetary damage threshold required to file a report with the FRA. However, I was able to find a cause for this next derailment, along with a whole lot of soybeans. A Norfolk Southern intermodal train heads north up the main line in Gainesville, Georgia. Those two old GE-9s in the lead look like they're working pretty hard. The tracks ahead of them are clear, but there's something the crew probably can't see out of their cab windows. Three covered hoppers are on the ground near the Cargill feed mill. This happened on the afternoon of Friday, July 29th, 2022, and I recorded this footage on July 31st. So what's all over the ground? Well, those are soybeans used in chicken feed. If you didn't already know, Gainesville is sometimes called the poultry capital of the world. There are several processing plants and feed mills around here. Anyway, these cars are known as three bay covered hoppers. You can see the three bays at the bottom. Rolling stock like this is loaded from hatches on the roof and gravity outlets underneath the cars take care of the unloading. Covered hoppers like these have a capacity of more than 5,000 cubic feet. It might surprise you, but covered hoppers are the most common freight cars on the rails of North America. Even in the days of precision scheduled railroading, you can still see unit trains like this one pulling long lines of them. Believe it or not, before the rise of the covered hopper, boxcars were used to haul bulk commodities. There's no doubt, cars like this save time in the loading and unloading process, which, of course, also saves money. As you can see, there isn't too much twisted metal here now. Keep in mind, I recorded this a couple days after the incident. Most of the wheels and trucks from the cars are piled up over here. Fortunately, I haven't heard about any injuries as a result of this accident. So those are my observations about this scene. Following the derailment in Gainesville, local news outlets reported that soybeans got into a nearby creek and fish started dying. This happened because the soybeans reduced the oxygen levels in the water. Now, I can't say with 100% certainty that the soybeans that resulted in the dead fish were from the Norfolk Southern derailment in Gainesville. However, according to Fox 5 Atlanta, Norfolk Southern did pay for the cleanup. All right, the next derailment we're going to look at resulted in a much bigger mess and two people injured. Columbia, South Carolina. These photos, courtesy of the Columbia Fire Department, show locomotives on their sides and twisted metal everywhere. This happened on July 11, 2022, around 8.15 a.m. According to the accident data as reported by railroads on the FRA's website, NS Train 238P310 with three engines, 16 loads, and nine empties collided with a dinky left out to foul on the main line at American Italian Pasta. 3,500 gallons of diesel fuel spilled. And by the way, dinky is a slang term for a small switch engine. You can actually see a yellow switcher in this photo. The cause here was listed as M501, interference other than vandalism with railroad operations by non-railroad employee. We've now reached the end of this special. Keep in mind, while some of those accidents appeared to be severe, none were fatal. And I know everything I covered happened in the Southeast. Well, that's because I live in the South and most of those scenes were places I was able to drive to and gather footage and information. I encourage you to go to the FRA's website and see what's happening where you live. I'll include a link in the description so you can view the accident data for yourself. Ultimately, I hope you learned something after watching this. And if you did, please share it with people you know who might also benefit from the information. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.